Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. It is Sunday, and that means it's time for the weekly recap of all the top stories that we brought you throughout the week. But they're all conveniently located in one location. We hope you enjoy the show. We'll see you next time. Have a wonderful day. Hi, lawyer. 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 Please. Go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up for a background subscription service. You'll be happy you did. If there's anyone out there you were ever curious about what was in their background, now is the time to do it. If you're going to get involved with somebody, now is the time to do it. When you go to crimetalksearch.com, you put in the name, literally millions of public records are searched and a report is generated. And it's going to give you a report. If they have multiple social media accounts, you're going to find it. If they have multiple phone numbers, multiple email addresses, it's going to be found. And more importantly, you're going to get information regarding criminal history. Hopefully the person you're searching has none whatsoever. But if it's there, it's going to be found. You're going to get everything you'd want to know, whether you're going into business or whether you're going into a personal relationship, you're going to be able to find out the information you want to know. So go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up today. You'll be happy you did. First, the prosecution in the Delphi murder case is objecting to allowing the jury to see the crime scene where police found the bodies of Abby Williams and Libby German. The defense made the request earlier this week in a motion to the court, and the defense also wants the jury to walk the trail from the Freedom Bridge to the Monon High Bridge to view where investigators say the girls were abducted, and the defense wants the jury to see where prosecutors claim Richard Allen parked his car on the day of the murders. Now, the special judge, Frances C. Gull, um, on Thursday said that she would wait until after the jury selection is made to make a decision on this motion. That jury trial is scheduled to begin October 14th, and it looks as though it will not be televised. That's very unfortunate. I think the uh, state of Indiana and everybody else in the world who has been following this case should be allowed to see what evidence the prosecution has, whether they can sustain their burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt to each and every element of the offense charged, or whether Mr. Allen will be found not guilty. You would think the courts would want the world to see the evidence or the lack thereof. It gives legitimacy to the court proceedings. All right, first on the docket, why did the sheriff shoot the judge? Well, we were hoping to find out some information today. Why? Because now former sheriff, Sean Mickey Steins, well, he had his preliminary hearing today and he resigned. That's why I said former sheriff, Sean Mickey Steins. He resigned as the sheriff, as the Letcher County Sheriff uh, late last week and he had his preliminary hearing today. Now, as you may recall, he is charged with the murder of the Letcher County District Judge, a guy by the name of Ken Mullins, who was shot to death in his judge's chambers on September 19th. Now, I'm telling you, I like what's going on here, right? September 19th, here we are, two, two and a half weeks. We're already having a preliminary hearing, ladies and gentlemen. Can you imagine such a thing in most jurisdictions? Oh, we need to do this. We need to do that. Oh, my goodness. This is good old-fashioned law stuff. Let's go try this thing. Not a complicated case. Let's cut to the chase. Anyway, Steins pled not guilty to the charge um, at his first appearance in uh, court. Now, he was originally represented by the public defenders at his arraignment on September 25th, but now he has retained um, Jeremy and Carrie Bartley, who are attorneys there in the area that specialize or primarily practice in criminal defense. Now, during the hearing in Morgan County, a video from the judge's chambers was played for the courtroom, and it showed the shooting. So what did we learn about this uh, video? Well, we learned there's no audio, and it's quite graphic. It just kind of happened. And we learned all this through the lead investigator, a guy from the Kentucky State Police by the name of Detective Clayton Stamper. Now, according to Detective Stamper, the judge and sheriff were at lunch earlier in that day with a group. And at one point, Mullins asked Steins if they needed to meet privately. Hmm, the plot thickens. During the hearing, questioning from both sides revealed that while in the uh, judge's chambers, Stein asked to see the judge's phone. Detective Stamper says that Steins called his own daughter 
from Mullen's phone, and her phone number was on there. Stamper says that Steins then shot the judge just seconds later. Now, the detective said that they have not yet looked at Stein's daughter's phone, but she has made statements to the police about her conversations with the judge. He has also said that an officer told him Stein's made this comment right after the shooting. They're trying to kidnap my wife and kid. Now, at the end of the hearing, Stein's attorney said he believes probable cause was established for first-degree manslaughter, but not murder. He said, I've heard nothing that indicates this is not an example of extreme emotional disturbance, he argued. But the prosecutor argued against that, and the judge agreed that there was probable cause for the murder charge. Now, remember, ladies and gentlemen, it's a preliminary hearing, pretty insignificant in the sense of the legal standard, probable cause. Would a reasonable person believe their crime was committed and that the defendant had something to do with it? Now remember, the judge at the preliminary hearing can't take in any legal defenses, can't consider you know, heat of passion type issues that may come up at trial. That's not the role of a preliminary hearing. It's a screening device to make sure that we are not wrongfully locking somebody up in custody, but the standard is so low. Remember, the evidence must be viewed in the light most favorable to the prosecution, drawing all inferences in the prosecution's favor. So the chance of this case getting thrown out at preliminary hearing, zero, zip, zilch, nada, nothing. It wasn't going to happen. Murder, right? The unlawful taking the life of another person that is unjustified. You met those, you met those elements. Throw in after deliberation. How quickly can after deliberation take place? Well, rather quickly. Oh, I see my daughter's name coming up on your phone. Okay, that's after deliberation. That is how quickly it can happen. So it's going to get interesting. Now, the defense attorneys on cross-examination when asking this detective stamper issues about, well, what was going on? What was the nature of the conversation? He was very vague, very, very vague. And nobody really got into why would the judge have Steiner's daughter's number on his phone. Very interesting. I don't know for sure. Anyway, we'll have to wait and see. I think this is going to get interesting. Now, I don't want to, I'm not going to jump to any conclusions. There's been rumors and innuendos that maybe there was something inappropriate going on, but we don't know that for sure. So we're certainly not going to keep uttering those uh, false uh, or alleged allegations. Let's just say that. We don't want to say they're false because we don't know. But there's some reason why that judge did that. And I don't think it was just because he was having a bad day. Apparently, these guys have known each other for a very long time. The whole manner in which it was done in the judge's chambers, that was cold, man. And just to be so calm, cool, and collective afterwards and just simply say, treat me fairly, almost seems like a man. Reminds me of that movie, A Time to Kill. Just, just something to think about, ladies and gentlemen. Something to think about. Uh, I've never seen a law enforcement officer so at peace as he sat in that chair. And didn't he look at peace as he listened to the evidence? Kind of like, yep. I mean, we know it's not a whodunit. The only question is, is what level of degree of murder? Are we talking like first degree murder after deliberation, second degree murder, maybe some sort of heat of passion, something along those lines? It's going to get interesting. It's going to get interesting. I can't wait for this trial to come out and actually hear why the sheriff did it. And you know what? A jury could possibly say jury nullification if what he is going to possibly allege the motive for this beef, if it comes out and turns out to be true, could get a not guilty jury nullification. Let me know what you think. I know it's early. We don't want to get, you know, we pride ourselves on facts. Uh, but uh, I think we can read between the lines here. There's something a little more going on than he just didn't like uh, the judge maybe not picking up the lunch tab or something. I don't know. going to be interesting. Botham Jeans Killer is eligible for parole. And uh, guess what? Botham Jeans family is, are not happy with that. So we have an update in the case of the uh, female Dallas police officer, former Dallas police officer, I should say, who uh, killed an un armed black man eating ice cream in his apartment um, and... Um, the victim's families are furious. So Amber Geiger uh, was still in uniform when she returned to her apartment complex on September 6th of 2018 and mistook Botham Jean's apartment for her own, which was on the floor directly below his. Uh, we covered this case. 
I'm not sure how she could have made that mistake, but apparently the apartments are all the same. She gets off the elevator, not paying attention, goes into the apartment, sees Mr. Gene sitting there, shoots him. Anyway, uh, Ms. Geiger testified at her trial that um, the uh, following year that she had found the door ajar and uh, shot and killed uh, Mr. Gene after mistaking him for an intruder. Now, Ms. Geiger was found guilty of murder in 2019 and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. But on Sunday, or what would have been Gene's 33rd birthday, the family of the deceased, Mr. Gene, um, found out that uh, Ms. Geiger qualified for parole after serving just five years in prison, according to the uh, Texas Department of Criminal Justice. That is not uncommon, ladies and gentlemen. That's why there needs to be kind of truth in sentencing. The reason why these sentences are so big is that the state doesn't want to keep them for lengthy periods of time. And the motivation for early release is good behavior and you have to behave to get paroled. And usually you're eligible about 50% on a non-crime of violence type of an offense. Just something for you to consider. Anyway, the family is expected to make contact with the Texas Parole Board in the coming days and um, let them know their feelings about um, whether Geiger should go free. As you may recall, Botham Jean's death uh, sparked some massive protests across uh, Texas as the residents remained outraged that the accountant had just been eating a bowl of ice cream on his couch when he was fatally shot. Now, uh, Ms. Geiger was fired from the Dallas Police Department in the aftermath, and uh, at her week-long trial back in September of 2019, she testified that she was scared to death and that she encountered Jean in what she believed to be her own apartment. After she was found guilty, Jean's brother, uh, Brandt, stunned the courtroom by embracing his brother's killer at an emotional sentencing hearing and telling her Jean would have wanted her to turn her life over to Christ. He said if she asked God for forgiveness, she would get it. Well, and also another weird twist, the judge that oversaw the case, a woman by the name of Tammy Kemp, also hugged the defendant and gave the ex-cop her Bible to take to prison. Anyway, um, Kemp uh, later said in an interview that uh, she could not refuse Geiger a hug and argued that her compassion was appropriate because the trial was over by then. I think poor move on the part of the judge. You shouldn't get involved in anything like that. It kind of just shows um, some partiality one way or other. But anyway, Miss Geiger has repeatedly tried to appeal her conviction, which is her right to do. The appeal hinged on the claim that uh, her mistake that uh, Jean's apartment for her own was reasonable and therefore was reasonable for, to shoot him. Anyway, her lawyers asked the appellate courts to acquit her of murder and uh, substitute a conviction for criminally negligent homicide, which carries a much lesser sentence. But the uh, prosecutors countered that the uh, error was not reasonable because Ms. Geiger acknowledged intending to kill Jean and that the murder is a result oriented offense. Anyway, the uh, court's chief justice, a guy by the name of Robert Burns and Justice Lena Myers and Robin Patricia Kiptis concurred with the prosecution, disagreeing that Geiger's belief that deadly force was needed and was reasonable. In the 23-page opinion, the justices also disagreed that evidence supporting a conviction of criminally negligent homicide rather than murder, and they pointed to Geiger's own testimony where she said she intended to kill Mr. Botham Jean. Um, that she was mistaken as to Jean's status as a resident in his own apartment or a burglar in hers does not change her mental state from intentional or knowing to criminally negligent, the court wrote. So they uh, declined to rely on Geiger's misperception of the circumstances leading to her mistaken beliefs as a basis to reform the jury's verdict um, in light of the direct evidence of her own intent to kill. Anyway, Geiger then asked the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, the state's highest um, forum for criminal cases to review the court's ruling, but that court declined to hear the case. So like I said, Geiger will now appear before the Texas Parole Board to plead her case for early release. Now, before people can be paroled, normally you have to accept responsibility, admit what you did was wrong, and that you are rehabilitated. We'll see if she can do that. And usually when there's public outroar, I doubt um, she'll get released this time. Maybe next time she's eligible in another year or so. Now, we've been following this story, and the former uh, Letcher County Sheriff, Sean Mickey Steins, was in court Tuesday, and uh, it's all regarding the uh, killing of the district court judge, Kevin Mullins. 
And uh, there's now footage that's out there of the shooting. And uh, we heard testimony about possible motives. And here is what we know so far. First, the shooting at the center of the case took place on September 19th, just a before 3 p.m. Now, Steins, who surrendered at the scene, has been accused of shooting Judge Mullins in his private chambers while other courthouse workers were in the building, just literally outside in the clerk's office. Now, local residents say the two men were friends and Stein served as the bailiff in Judge Mullins' court for several years before he was ultimately elected to be sheriff back in 2018. Now, the video clip was less than a minute long and did not include audio. Uh, in it, a man identified by the police as Sheriff Steins is shown firing multiple times at the judge behind his desk and then leaving the chambers. Now, Steins, who last week entered an initial plea of not guilty, has been charged with the murder and the death of Judge Mullins, who was shot and killed in his chambers there in uh, Whitesburg, Kentucky. Now, the Kentucky State Police Detective Clayton Stamper testified that the full video shows Stein using his own phone to make multiple calls and then using the judge's phone to make a call. That's immediately, uh, and then immediately the uh, shooting took place. Now, in the testimony, Detective Stamper said the calls were to Stein's daughter. Now, Stamper said the phones had been sent to forensic uh, teams for examination and uh, though his daughter's phone had not been examined, Stampers confirms Stein's daughter's phone number had been saved in the judge's phone and was called before the shooting. Detective Stamper said the two men went to lunch earlier in the day, and that's also corroborated by other people's testimony. And the detective said a witness said at one point, Mullins, the judge, asked the sheriff if they needed to meet privately, though the context of that whole conversation was unclear to this witness. Now, Stamper said witnesses are still being uh, interviewed throughout this process. Now, Detective Stamper also added that Steins was mostly calm when he was interviewed after being taken into custody, though he didn't offer a motive. Basically, all he said was, treat me fair, is what the detective said. When asked by a defense attorney, uh, Mr. Jeremy Bartley, whether Stein said anything about protecting his family when he was taken into custody, Stamper said Steins allegedly made a comment that they were, quote, trying to kidnap my wife and kid, end quote. Now, the attorney, Bartley, said more information will be provided, obviously, through the, out the investigation, but he declined to speculate on a motive for the shooting outside of what has been discussed in court. Now, Steins announced Monday that he was retiring slash resigning from his position as sheriff. Governor Andy Bashir, the governor of Kentucky, called for uh, the sheriff to resign last week in a letter he sent to then uh, sheriff while he was in the uh, Leslie County Jail. Now, here's where things get a little interesting. Steins is also a defendant in a federal lawsuit alleging that he failed to properly train and supervise a deputy later found guilty in state court of trading favorable treatment in the jail back in 2021 for women on home incarceration in exchange for sexual favors. And guess where the favors were being done, allegedly? In Mullins, Judge Mullins' private chambers. Now, attorneys claim that there were no cameras in Mullins' uh, chambers at that particular time. Now, remember, Steins is not a personal defendant. He is named in his official capacity as the sheriff. So what we also know is that Sheriff Steins was deposed in that lawsuit just three days before the shooting last month. And during Tuesday's hearings, Steins' attorneys asked the detective on the stand about that case. But the detective said he was unsure about any of the details in that lawsuit. And the attorneys for the plaintiff in that case have said they were surprised by the shooting and are uncertain whether it was related to any uh, depositions, let alone the sheriff's deposition, just three days before. Now, the judge overseeing the case uh, moved the case forward so it can go to the grand jury. The court found probable cause, and no particular court date has, in fact, yet been set. Now, this is where it gets a little interesting. I've received lots of information from people that purport they're local. There's been information out there is, was the judge doing something nefarious? We don't know. It's speculation and rumor at this point. We don't like to do that, but... It's something that has been out there and actually been in some mainstream uh, uh, media sources, so to speak. There's allegations. We're not saying anybody did anything wrong, presumption of innocence. We're not trying to disparage anybody's name. There's allegations that maybe something was done inappropriately by the judge. Then there's also the potential speculation that maybe Sheriff Steins was not exactly a good guy 
and the judge was trying to help Sheriff Stein's wife and daughter get out of a uh, difficult situation. We just don't know. So we're just going to have to wait and see as more information becomes available. There's a lot of rumors going around out there right now, but you have to be careful as to what you say. But those are rumors. Now, going back to crimetalksearch.com, all right? Just happened to, um, you know, prior to the show, run a quick background report on um, Judge Mullins. Just happened to run one on uh, Sean Mickey Steins. Let me just tell you, ladies and gentlemen, these two men are probably the most boring individuals in the country. I don't think I've ever seen a report so boring. None of these people even had a speeding ticket. Nothing. Um, we think uh, there was obviously a Facebook page. We went to the sheriff's sheriff's uh, website uh, there in Letcher County. It's down. The uh, Letcher County Facebook page. Uh, Judge Mullins. These people are boring. They're not even going. They're not even buying cars. Uh, I think the most recent thing that the uh, sheriff owned was a like 2020 Kia. That was it. I don't know if these people have any possible uh, energy or bone in their body. <laughs> There's usually something that shows up in a background check that would indicate something, uh, what was going on in their particular life. Uh, but that was it. The judges owned a couple of properties in his lifetime. And it looks like, it looks like he may own a couple of Ford Tauruses and a Ford Explorer. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. Unbelievable. You can't... I guess it's a good thing. Boring. Boring is good, but you just never know uh, what you're going to find on those background checks. But uh, the sheriff and the judge, apparently good friends. I don't know. Interesting story. I just, it keeps me up at night trying to think of the motive. I want the motive. Like I said, was sheriff a good guy and it's a time to kill kind of situation? Or was sheriff a bad guy? Judge was helping out. Apparently the judge liked the ladies. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Was he trying to steal, take away his family? I, who knows? Who knows? It's going to be a good, um, interesting trial to watch. Hopefully we get there soon. Heck, we only had three weeks from the time of the crime to the preliminary hearing. So let's do this thing.